This is Dermatology Weekly, the official podcast of MDH Dermatology. I'm Nick Andrews. Coming up in this holiday edition of Dermatology Weekly, we wish you and yours a happy Thanksgiving or Thanksgiving weekend, depending on when you're listening to this, from all of us at MDH. Coming up in this episode, it's a resident takeover edition with Dr. Daniel Missouri. He and his guests will be discussing nail unit squamous cell carcinoma. Peer to Peer is coming up after the news. We begin the news today with some breaking news in wool. Fine wool garments can improve atopic dermatitis. That's according to research presented at the Medscape Live Annual Las Vegas Dermatology Seminar, which this year, of course, was held virtually. This finding, of course, flies in the face of conventional wisdom, which holds that patients who have atopic dermatitis should shun wool clothing in favor of cotton. This is because it's said that wool is irritating and promotes itching. And this may indeed be true for rougher forms of wool, but not for fine wool. In one study, researchers randomly assigned 50 patients to wear merino wool as their top and bottom layer for six weeks, and then to switch to non-woolen clothing. Or to do the exact opposite. The other group did the opposite. They wore non-wool for the first six weeks and then switched to fine wool. Patients were both children and adults. They had mild or moderate disease. The researchers examined patient response changes in the eczema area and severity index score and the dermatology life quality index score to assess differences in fine wool and cotton. The researchers report that the average easy score for those who began in the fine wool group improved from a baseline of 4.5 to 1.7 at week six. That's a significantly greater improvement than in the group wearing their regular clothing. Similarly, for those who were switched to the fine wool group, there was a decrease in the average easy score from week six to week 12. So the severity score got lower. The average dermatology life quality index scores improved for patients who began on the merino wool group from 6.9 at baseline to 3.4 at week six. For those who wore their regular clothing first and then went from mean baseline score of 6.7 to 6.2 at week six, which was not significant. However, these patients experienced an improvement in score at week 12 of 3.7 after switching to merino wool. The researchers also reported that static investigators' global assessment scores showed significantly greater improvement while patients wore merino wool garments rather than their regular clothing. And in a similar study from Australia, researchers investigated the same thing in basically the same way among 39 children who were between four weeks old and three years old. These patients all had mild or moderate disease. The primary endpoint of this study was change in the scorecard index after six weeks. The scorecard index is, of course, the scoring atopic dermatitis index. In this study, they reported an average of 7.6 point greater reduction at six weeks while wearing merino wool compared with cotton. Researchers also reported that the reduction in secondary endpoints of atopic dermatitis severity index and infant's dermatitis quality of life index while wearing merino wool followed suit. In contrast, switching from wool to cotton resulted in an increase in both scores. Also, use of topical corticosteroids was significantly reduced while patients wore merino wool. So what's the difference between regular wool and merino wool? Well, wool harvested for merino sheep is characterized by finer diameter fibers. In the first study we discussed, the fiber diameter was 17 and a half micrometers. That makes for a soft fabric with outstanding moisture absorption, which is a quality that is beneficial in patients with atopic dermatitis since their lesional skin loses the ability to regulate moisture, of course. It's important to note that funding came from an organization called Australian Wool Innovation, as well as from the Australian government. Australia, of course, is among the leaders in global wool production. And now Tildrakizumab showed a high rate of sustained control of psoriasis, along with a favorable safety profile. That's according to a full five-year results of a long-term extension study of the drug. The study enrolled 622 patients with moderate to severe plaque psoriasis. Patients in the study had at least a PASI-75 or PASI-100 response with the 100 milligram or 200 milligram dose of the humanizing monoclonal antibody IL-23P19 inhibitor at week 28. 
The cohort also included patients who were partial responders or non-responders to Intercept and were then switched to Tildrakizumab. Of the 622 patients enrolled, 545 completed the full five years of the study. The researchers reported that nearly 90% of the patients who had a PASI-75 response on the 100 milligram dose at week 28 maintained their PASI-75 throughout the subsequent four and a half years. This was also true for 93% of patients who had a PASI-75 response on a 200 milligram dose, which is a dose that is approved abroad, though not in the United States. This was also true for patients with a PASI-90 and a PASI-100. Okay, so how about safety? Very few patients left the study because of loss of efficacy or adverse events. Indeed, the exposure-adjusted rate of drug-related serious adverse events was 0.8 cases per 100 patient years of tildrakizumab, 100 milligrams, and 0.5 per 100 patient years at 200 milligrams. The rates of drug-related serious adverse events leading to treatment discontinuation were 0.3 per 100 patient years for the 100 milligram dose and 0.2 for the 200 milligram dose. The rates of treatment emergent severe infection were 1.2 and 1.3 respective for 100 patient years on the lower and higher doses. The study was presented at the European Academy of Dermatology and Venereology Annual Congress by Dr. Diamani Thachi. Dr. Thachi is a professor of dermatology and is the director of the Comprehensive Center for Inflammation Medicine at Lübeck University, which is in Germany. He said that he thinks the adverse events are generally similar to what he has seen with other biologics, but slightly less with tildrakizumab. And finally today, our COVID-19 pandemic update. The American Medical Association House of Delegates has adopted a policy to educate physicians on how to speak with patients about COVID-19 vaccination to counteract widespread misinformation about the vaccine development process. Under the organization's new vaccination education policy, the AMA will provide physicians with culturally appropriate patient education materials. Educating the public about the safety and efficacy of the COVID-19 vaccine program is an urgent priority, according to the AMA. This is especially true among populations that have been disproportionately affected by the disease. Black and Latino people are being hospitalized for COVID-19 at far higher rates than white Americans. Polls have indicated that many people will not get vaccinated when supplies of the new vaccines are available, although public support is rising. A recent Gallup poll found that 58% of surveyed adults were willing to be inoculated, but that's up from 50% in September. A Kaiser Family Foundation survey in September found that a majority of Americans were skeptical of a rushed vaccine because they were concerned that the Trump administration was pressuring the FDA to approve a vaccine ahead of the election. The AMA also adopted a new ethics policy about physician immunization. On Monday, the AMA House of Delegates stated that physicians who are not immunized from a vaccine-preventable disease, have an ethical responsibility to take appropriate actions to protect patients and colleagues. The AMA Code of Ethics has long maintained that physicians have a strong ethical duty to accept immunizations when a safe, effective vaccine is available. However, the organization said in a news release that, quote, it is not ethically problematic to exempt individuals when a specific vaccine poses a risk due to underlying medical conditions, unquote. Ethical concerns arise when physicians are allowed to decline vaccinations for non-medical reasons. And that's it for the news in Dermatology Weekly. When we come back, the residents are taking over, including Dr. Daniel Missouri. Welcome back to Dermatology Weekly. It's time now for the peer-to-peer portion of the show. Please welcome our resident host, Dr. Daniel Missouri. Today, I'm speaking with Dr. Mohamed Dani, a dermatology resident at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. We are going to be talking about his latest cutest resident corner column on nail unit squamous cell carcinoma, or SCC. Thanks so much for joining me today, Dr. Danny. Thank you, Dr. Missouri, for hosting me today. It's always a pleasure. So to start us off, can you define nail unit SCC for us? 
Yeah, absolutely. So nail unit squamous cell carcinoma is a malignant neoplasm, just like any other squamous cell carcinoma. But what's particular about it is that it arises in the nail unit. So any part of the nail unit can be involved, the nail bed, the nail matrix, the nail grooves, the nail folds. And it can present clinically as a tumor sometimes, but also at times it can present as nonspecific nail plate changes, which makes it really hard to diagnose or even suspect clinically sometimes. And you did talk about in your column how the diagnosis of nail unit SCC is often delayed, and I'm sure it relates to exactly what you just said, but can you expand a little bit about um, why that delay in diagnosis um, happens? Right, right. So sometimes patients are diagnosed many years after nail unit SCC develops, and that's for many reasons. So the first reason is clinically nail unit SCC can mimic benign conditions of the nail unit, like onychomycosis, warts, paronychia. It is really most commonly mistaken for verruca vulgaris. Many patients get treatments for warts underneath their nail plates, and they just not respond to the treatments that they're getting. And eventually they get a biopsy and it turns out to be a nail unit SCC. So it's really important for dermatologists to think about nail SCC when seeing a subungual wart lesion, especially if it is non-resolving after several treatments. Another reason for the delay in diagnosis is that those tumors are usually painless and asymptomatic, which keeps patients from seeking care. Fortunately, nail unit SCC has a low rate of metastasis, so it's not like melanoma or Merkel cell carcinoma. However, because it is in a special site and it's close proximity to the phalanx or to bone, a delayed diagnosis can result in local destruction and bone invasion. So it's imperative for dermatologists to think about nail unit SCC when they are evaluating a nail lesion. Absolutely. And um, to that point, in, in an attempt to hopefully help um, prevent delays in diagnosis, I really appreciated what you included in your column, which um, were the red flags that dermatologists should keep in mind when they're evaluating a subungual lesion um, that would prompt them to biopsy to rule out nail unit SCC. Could you tell us about um, what some of those red flags are? Yes, absolutely, Dr. Missouri. So when evaluating a subungual lesion, things to be thinking about that would prompt a biopsy to rule out malignancy would include things like a non-healing lesion, nail plate nodularity, a known history of infection with human papilloma virus type 16 and 18 or other high-risk HPVs, history of radiation, history of arsenic exposure, and immunosuppression. Um, so usually any subungual lesion in an immunosuppressed individual, especially if it is chronic and non-healing, would prompt a biopsy because usually those patients are at very high risk. Thank you so much. That's awesome. So I think those are really important um, for everyone to keep in mind when they see a subungal lesion um, to go through that, uh, you know, those risk factors um, when they take a history with their patients and kind of help them, um, you know, make a decision uh, about biopsying or not. Absolutely. So um, you mentioned this a little bit, but um, are there any other risk factors for nail unit SCC that we haven't talked about just yet? The risk factors are not really well defined in the literature for nail unit SCC, but there are studies showing that nail unit SCC happens more commonly in middle-aged and older individuals, in men more than in women, and uh, usually more often seen on the fingernails than in the toenails. And the most common site reported so far is the thumb. So the thumb is really a good location for nail unit SCC. Uh, other risk factors to think about, as I mentioned before, in immunocompromised status, patients with genetic skin cancer syndromes or patients that have a propensity to develop squamous cell carcinomas like patients with xeroderma pigmentosum, for example. And I want to circle back on HPV as a risk factor. I mentioned before history of high-risk HPV infection, but there is a study that showed that even though there's no clear pathogenic etiology for NSCC or nail unit squamous cell carcinoma, there have been some reports of HPV as the cause of nail unit SCC, and they found 136 cases of nail unit SCC that were positive for HPV, 
and half of those cases were positive for high-risk HPV. So even though not all nail unit SCC is caused by HPV, it seems to be there's a subset that can be caused by HPV. When it comes to treating nail unit SCC, um, is there a treatment of choice and have any other treatments been suggested as well? So that's a very good question. And um, it's always interesting to talk about the treatment options for tumors in sensitive areas like the nail unit. The answer usually is surgery for squamous cell carcinoma. There are non-surgical approaches that have been tried as case reports in the literature, like 5-FU, imiquimod, cryotherapy, carbon dioxide laser, photodynamic therapy. But those are only case reports and there aren't large uh, data studies in order to support the use of them. There's more evidence in the literature for surgical approaches like wide local excision, Mohs micrographic surgery, and even digital amputation, which we hopefully try to avoid uh, to decrease morbidity in those patients. So if we take each one of those surgical approaches for wide local excisions, the most common approach would be an on block excision. And usually what the surgery entails would be to start with a transverse incision on the base of the distal phalanx, which is then prolonged laterally and distally to the distal nail fold down to the bone. And then after the incision is made to the depth of the bone, the matrical horns can be destroyed by electrocoagulation. And then the defect can be closed by a full thickness skin graft or by secondary intent. And really studies that tried both secondary intent or skin graft as a way of closure didn't find a difference in the outcome. So secondary intent is always a great option for this. Uh, so that's for wide local excision. And um, studies show that for wide local excision, in some studies, there's really very low relapse rates, but in other studies, there is some high relapse rates. So there's no consensus as to whether this would be a great option to prevent recurrence. But the other option is always Mohs micrographic surgery. And this has been shown in the literature to have very low recurrence rates. And the success rate is very high in the 90s in most studies. And um, there are a few commentaries in certain journals that were published recently on Mohs micrographic surgery for nail unit SCC, recommending it as a first line treatment. Although the studies are not clear yet. There are no clinical trials comparing wide local excision with Mohs head to head to kind of make this conclusion. But Mohs micrographic surgery um, is usually a very good option, uh, especially if someone is specialized and feels comfortable doing this for nail unit SCC. Distal amputation, in my opinion, should be considered as a last resort, um, especially when like why local excision is not reasonable or when Mohs micrographic surgery fails to achieve clear margins. This is because it's important to reduce unnecessary amputations and patient morbidity. Um, I also want to mention something about uh, the surgical approach for nail unit SCC. Uh, I just came across this article that was published in the latest issue of Derm Surge, uh, which came out after I wrote my column. And it kind of talks about when to perform imaging for nail unit SCC. Um, and they interestingly recommended performing imaging only when someone is thinking of doing wide local excision, but not if someone wants to do Mohs micrographic surgery. And this is because they think that if the Mohs surgeon is comfortable with his technique or her technique, then uh, they are capable of finding bone invasion as they're doing their Mohs layers. And then if they're comfortable doing, uh, taking layers on superficial invasion, then there's really no need for imaging prior. Uh, while for people who are thinking of doing a wide local excision, then it will be better to get imaging just to make sure there's no bone invasion. And of course, this is all speculations. At the end of the day, uh, even if the patient is undergoing most surgery, it would probably be a better idea to get imaging prior just so that the most surgeon knows where they're going before they start their surgery. So I, in my opinion, I do think imaging is, is a good idea to perform before uh, triaging the patient for what type of surgery they're getting. That's really interesting. Thank you so much for going through all of those treatment options. Um, one other thought that I had and I wanted to ask you about because you had mentioned you know, the role of HPV and pathogenesis, um, 
Are you aware of any data using um, HPV targeted therapies um, in male unit SCC, like intralesional um, HPV vaccination, for example? That's really a very good question. And I'm a big fan of targeted therapy. And um, for using HPV vaccines to treat HPV-related processes, this has been tested in the literature for genital warts, specifically refractory genital warts. And I have read a paper where they reported few cases of recalcitrant genital warts that responded to treatment with the Gardasil 9 HPV vaccine intralesionally. I have not come across um, any study about that for nail unit SCC, but if they're using it for warts, I think it would be a great idea to think about this for malignant conditions like nail unit SCC or other uh, tumors that are caused by HPV. So I think this is a really good thought and I'm hoping we can, um, the scientists can test that later down the line. Well, on that note, I want to thank you again for joining me and speaking with me about this important and, you know, um, somewhat neglected topic. I really appreciate your sharing your expertise with us. And until next time, this has been Resident Takeover. Thank you so much, Dr. Missouri. Always a pleasure. And that's a wrap on this edition of Dermatology Weekly. I am the voice of the news portion of the show, Nick Andrews. Dermatology Weekly is produced by MD Edge editors Melissa Sears and Alicia Sunners, along with MD Edge editor Elizabeth Meshkadi. All of our podcasts are produced by executive editor Kathy Scarbeck. You're listening to MD Edge. Mm-hmm.